So, um, uh, my name is Julian Haig. I'm a radiologist, uh, interventional radiologist uh, from London. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you to Catherine for the invitation to come and speak today. Um, interventional radiology is really uh, using uh, modern scanning techniques like CT, MR, uh, MRI, and uh, uh, X-rays to guide treatment, whereas uh, traditionally surgeons would use their hands and eyes to guide treatment. Uh, and in the 50 years since, uh, since it, it's been invented, interventional radiology has really exploded. Um, and uh, uh, we can see that uh, there's uh, good evidence of an increasing demand, um, which is predicted to rise uh, approximately 17% year on year for the next five years. Uh, certainly in the States, it's already recognized as a, an independent specialty. Um, I'm based uh, at uh, University College Hospital in London, central London. It's a large teaching hospital uh, affiliated or next door to University College London. Uh, and uh, I'm very honored to, to work in the new Macmillan Cancer Center that houses all the outpatient treatment uh, and the outpatient clinics. Um, uh, UCL put a lot of money into oncology recently. And on the back of that, we were asked to, uh, to beef up the interventional oncology uh, service. Uh, so this came about last year, middle of last year, and really it was an opportunity to build a service around, uh, around the patient. Uh, and with that in mind, we uh, got together, or asked for the money uh, to, to have our own dedicated clinical nurse specialist. Uh, we've got a data manager, uh, we've got a, an administrator, who's on hand to book scans and blood tests and hospital admissions and so on. Uh, we've got our own, um, own hospital beds, uh, which is quite unique for, for a radiology uh, service. And we've got our own weekly uh, outpatient clinic in the Macmillan Cancer Center. Uh, and as clinicians, we, we really uh, uh, started off concentrating on these four areas. Well, first of all, the ablation service, and ablation is uh, putting, um, using CT or MRI to guide uh, needles into tumors, usually in the liver or lung. Uh, we can use these needles then to heat up or cool down tumors and uh, destroy them that way. Uh, we've got, uh, we integrated the pain control service, so we've got three uh, highly specialist chronic pain anesthetists um, who also use, uh, using interventional techniques and CT scans and so on. Um, we've integrated our, our vascular access service, so these are, it's a very busy service, putting in lines, port caths, and so on and so on for chemotherapy. Uh, and also with integrating that, and this is my field, is vascular oncology, which is um, using uh, vascular techniques to treat tumors. Uh, and, and this whole setup really allows us to coordinate the patient's treatment. Uh, and that's particularly relevant uh, with patients coming into London from, from outside. Also, it allows us to communicate effectively with the teams that are sending the, the patients up and uh, allows us to, to book scans and appointments and so on. Uh, and I think most important in all of this is that it really allows us to collect the data. And uh, as radiologists, I think we've uh, lagged behind in past years in, in really getting to grips with data and driving forward new treatments. Uh, so my specific remit today is, is to talk about TACE, which is transarterial chemoembolization. This has been around for years and years, uh, treating liver tumors. Uh, the reason why it's, it works and uh, is down to the liver blood supply. Um, we've, we've got two blood supplies. One is the hepatic artery, which is um, uh, uh, an artery coming off the aorta. And uh, that supplies around about 90% or 95% of liver tumors. And uh, then we've got the portal vein, and that's bringing blood up from the intestines and also conveniently supplies the liver tissue itself. So uh, we've already got a route there directly into tumors. Um, and the taste always involves putting a catheter in from the femoral artery in the groin, and then under x-ray guidance, we feed it into the hepatic artery. And then we can inject, inject uh, the drugs as needed. Um, and these can be in various formats. Uh, quite popular years ago were the purely liquid uh, liquid drugs. The problem with that is that you inject the liquid and it quickly washes out of the liver. So um, this, was, uh, this has been followed up uh, by injecting the liquid and then an embolic particle. An embolic particle would block the blood supply with the idea that you trap the, the liquid chemotherapy agent into the liver. This is a, a bit of a variable um, 
procedure and um, results um, reflect uh, the various particles that were used, the various liquids that were used. And so on the back of that, uh, drug eluting beads were developed. Uh, it's a UK invention and it's been around in clinical practice since about 2006. Uh, and the, the rationale behind its use really comes from experiments like this where, where you can grow uh, tumours in the liver and, uh, and this is a rabbit VX2 model uh, and then give uh, drugs uh, in various ways. So in this, in this uh, model, uh, the same dose of the drug, and we're using urinotecan here, um, uh, same dose of, of drug given into the, in, into the hepatic artery same dose and into a femoral vein, and the same dose loaded onto these drug-coated beads. And then you look at the tumor 24 hours later, sorry, you look at the tumor 24 hours later, uh, and you can see, what we can see is that the concentration of irinotecan in the tumor itself is, is 10 times higher with the, with the drug-coated beads than it is with intravenous root and it's about 65 times higher than it is with just purely injecting into the hepatic artery. Um, and what we can also see, uh, and as you'd expect, with, with uh, very high concentrations of drug, drug trapped in the tumor, if you look at these, these cells under the microscope that we're seeing, uh, just with a purely arter intra-arterial route of delivery, 25% tumor necrosis, with the intravenous delivery, we're seeing about 60% necrosis. And putting the same amount of drug onto DC beads, we're getting about 95% necrosis within the tumors. Um, and uh, also, as you, as you might anticipate, that the drug is trapped within the tumors and not leaching around the circulation. And so we're seeing about 50% lower systemic uh, drug concentrations than you would with intravenous or intra-arterial routes. Uh, and this uh, is also going to, going to give us less systemic toxicity. And you might think this is all experimental, but it's, it's, uh, you get very similar results um, in human studies. And uh, this is an example of a study, a British study, uh, uh, based out of Liverpool, the Paragon 2 study, which shows pathologically that necrosis rates are very high uh, and even higher than systemic chemotherapy. Um, so, so uh, we started up the uh, drug eating bead taste program in January, and initially uh, we were required to, because uh, it's a new treatment that's uh, not been assessed yet by NICE, we were required to, uh, to do it under rigorous, rigorous strict controls, uh, and we started off with uh, treating metastatic colorectal cancer patients. Uh, who were running out of options with uh, conventional systemic chemotherapy. Um, the patients uh, uh, worked up in the outpatient department with some routine tests um, and uh, some uh, usually use CT or MRI scans to uh, stage the disease and plan for treatment. Um, if the disease involves one lobe of the liver, then we, we, give, we plan for two sessions uh, each four weeks apart. The, if the tumors are in both lobes of the liver, we plan for four sessions, each of those two weeks apart. Uh, and then we uh, scan the patients three months after starting treatment. And then if there's any areas we need to come back to, we'll come back at, at that stage. And uh, the patients that we, we can treat are uh, uh, quite extensive liver disease. So we can treat up to 60% of the uh, of liver involvement um, and uh, the patient comes in usually on the day of treatment. Um, we, we, we know that this is a painful procedure and it's been shown, uh, shown in, in, uh, in many studies previously and needs, usually needs heavy doses of, uh, of painkillers and so on before the procedure. Uh, and what, we, what we've developed is is a technique of putting local anesthetic in the nerves around the spine. And this, um, this is done under local anesthetic, usually six injections, uh, and has been very effective at almost obliterating the pain associated with this procedure uh, and allows our patients to get up and about and usually home within 24 hours. Uh, the procedure itself is done in the interventional radiology suite. 
uh, under x-ray. Um, we uh, give the patient sedation and local anesthetic. Uh, we put a little tube into the groin, uh, usually, right, uh, usually the right groin, feed up a tube into the liver under the x-ray control, and then deliver the beads slowly into the liver. Um, it's about 15, 16 mils of beads that go in over one mil per minute. Um, the total procedure time is uh, usually less than an hour. Um, patients go back to the ward. Uh, usually they have a, a PCA, which is patient-controlled uh, anesthesia. Um, uh, and only about half the patients will use this. Um, usually a 24-hour stay, occasionally 48 hours, but uh, patients can eat and drink and fully mobilize. Uh, and home the next, usually home the next day. And they come back to clinic 10 days later, and then we repeat the cycle as we'd planned for. Uh, so, so far, uh, we've done 39 treatments um, in a total of 14 patients, and we've got a, a, a response rate uh, in the tumors uh, of around 9 out of 14 patients, just over 60%. And we're comparing this to patients who really run out of options with uh, systemic chemotherapy and looking at uh, phase one trials where, where the response rates are going to be uh, less, certainly less than 10%. Uh, and so I think we, we're quite encouraged by this and, and certainly also we're seeing very low rates of adverse events. Um, as an exa example of one of our recent patients, a uh, 58-year-old 50, lady with metastatic colorectal cancer. She's got mainly liver disease but with one or two uh, spots in the peritoneum, and uh, she was progressing through the standard chemotherapy regimens, uh, and her CEA level, which is a, a, a biological marker blood test, uh, looking at the disease, uh, was, was uh, sky high, 179. Um, and this is her scan. You can see she's got uh, lots of liver lesions. Um, these are growing over, over, a short, over the few months that, before she came to see us. Um, and we treated her with four sessions. This is, uh, a, you can see a fine tube over here. Uh, I can't show that to you, but a fine tube in the uh, hepatic artery. Uh, and then this is, these are the beads going into the right hepatic artery. Uh, we, we can just outline a very small tumor in the right lobe of the liver. This was repeated four times. She tolerated it very well. Three months later, we can see uh, the, all the tumors have become necrotic. Now, we don't see the traditional reduction in size of the tumors, but what we see is that the, the tissue inside the tumors um, turns effective, effectively cystic or turns to liquid. Um, and uh, then over time, we hope that these things will uh, shrink down. Uh, and we, we've seen in her a, a, a substantial decrease in her CEA level. And that, again, backs up the, the results that we see on this scan. Uh, is another one of our earlier patients. She was a 50-something-year-old 50, 50 lady um, with metastatic cancer diagnosed uh, five years, and she'd had uh, absolutely everything thrown at her. And um, we can see that she was progressing with no real further options for, uh, for treatment. She's looking at a phase one trial. And we can see in the three months before we started treating her, that this uh, tumor in the right lobe of the liver, probably not projecting very well, but this, this tumor is a huge thing, uh, and it's growing uh, insidiously over the last, last few months. So she came up and had a total of seven cycles of uh, irinotec and beads, um, and we see a very marked reduction in the size, and also how this tumor enhances after, after we give uh, the intravenous contrast. She had absolutely no adverse events, no uh, toxicity at all, um, apart from feeling a bit tired in the weeks after, in the week, uh, or a few days after each treatment. And also on the back of that, we see that the, her CEA level has, has fallen from 580 to 161. Uh, so these uh, these initial results certainly are experienced, and what's uh, out there in the literature very very encouraging when it comes to colorectal cancer. Uh, and uh, you know, that's a common, that's a common disease. Uh, we're going to see a lot less in the literature on uh, uh, ocular melanoma. But there, is, there are several publications out there. Um, a small one published last year, uh, five patients, um, a good response, 80% uh, response in the, in the tumors after Dibiri. 
the largest published series that I can find was from Gian Maria Fiorentini in Italy, 52 patients. Uh, it's a multi-center trial, uh, only single arm. And um, uh, he saw uh, uh, a very good response, o almost all the patients responding uh, with a reduction, with a, a necrosis of up to 80% in their tumors, a uh, few patients with stable disease, and an overall survival of uh, nearly 14 months. Uh, and then uh, a couple of recent, recent papers, one from uh, Rob Martin in Kentucky, who's got the most experience with drug eluting beads worldwide. Uh, he's he's uh, published this uh, small series, six patients, but again, uh, using a slightly different uh, chemotherapy agent, but same technique, it's getting a response rate of 60% at 12 months. Survival again around, around uh, over a year, just over a year. And then last week, uh, we heard from uh, Professor Pereira in, from Heilbronn, uh, with a phase two study of 20 patients, uh, again using uh, Dr. Rubison beads uh, and getting uh, encouraging early results. Um, so, in summary, uh, DCB technology, we know that it's, uh, in principle, it's, uh, it works, um, it's safe with a, uh, a low incidence of ad adverse events, and certainly in our experience and those of others, it's very well tolerated. It's not a terribly difficult procedure, and there is a well-publicized standard protocol to follow, which I think is immensely important when we're looking at new technology and how it's going to roll out over um, in different centers. And the, the small series that are published so far in ocular melanoma show good response rates with both Dubiri, that's a Rinotecan, and the Dr. Rubicin beads, uh, and also similar results across the published series. Uh, we still don't know which, which is the best agent to use, and we still don't know which is going to be the optimal dose, and we don't know what, how it's going to integrate with systemic treatments, or indeed when to start and how long to continue with treatment. Um, I think the answers to those questions will come if we get together and put all the data into, into international registries. Uh, thank you. Um, well, we were asked to, to do 10 patients and report back to our uh, chemotherapy governance committee with the results of those first 10 patients. And they restricted us initially to, to colorectal cancer because it's common and we could quickly get those 10 patients. Um, but with the understanding that um, if, the, if the governance committee felt it was safe, then we can extend it. Uh, to other tumours, uh, and I think that's the stage we're at now, and we, I think we'd be delighted, uh, certainly on the back of this evidence that's coming out now, uh, that it does show very great promise with things like breast cancer, uh, ocular melanoma, and cholangiocarcinoma, that we can roll it out, and I think uh, what we're doing is approaching the, the governance committee now uh, and giving them the evidence, and also our experience with very low um, adverse event rates, and I think, um, I don't think the Governance Committee will have any problems in accepting uh, uh, ocular melanoma. Brilliant. Um, if anybody else has got any other questions, um, would you mind just writing them down or catching Dr. Hague in the break? What we're going to do is we're going to have a very, very quick table of questions for the panel. Um, if anybody else has got any other questions, um, please do put them down and we'll get them to you. Thank you very much.